Hello, everybody. We're just going to give one more minute to wait for see if more people join. But it's nice to see that already we have a decent amount of participants joining us. We're very excited to, to bring you a great, a great webinar today, all about Founders Equity. And, and again, the title of, of our workshop today is Founders Equity, Making Gains While Maintaining Your Stakes. And whilst people are joining, I'll, I'll uh, start introducing myself, my name, and, and the rest of the Kickstart team. My name is Mireya Maki. I'm the Interim Director for Kickstart Venture Services, which is a department within the Office of Technology Commercialization that supports the commercialization of research at, at UNC. At Kickstart, we support startups that have some sort of relationship to the research at UNC, intellectual property or connection, have developed, been developed through, through UNC, and we support them in different ways. Uh, we help with their business strategy. We have a little bit of proof of concept funding, wet lab accelerator space, uh, we'll help them uh, with uh, grant writing and other services. And of course, uh, connections and uh, great uh, webinars and training sessions like the ones today. Uh, here from the Kickstart team are also Haley French uh, and uh, Judy Prasad who will be monitoring all the Q&A sessions at the end of the webinar. Judy will be uh, collecting any questions that you have. Please, by all means, put them in, in the chat function and we'll ask those at the end of the session. I'll start with some introductions to our panelists. Then we'll have uh, the main presentation from Matt Cohen and then we'll move into, again, a panel Q&A session with everybody here. So with that, let me start by introducing, again, we have a fantastic panel uh, today. Uh, we have representing uh, uh, the academic founders. Uh, we have Mike Ramsey, you know, who's a founder and advisor, a serial founder, I would call him. Uh, he has a very distinguished scientific career. He holds the Mini Golby Distinguished Professor in Chemistry. He's a chemistry chair at UNC. And he also uh, on the faculty departments of biomedical engineering and applied physical science. Besides that, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, the Optical Society of America, the American Chemical Society, and the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. But uh, importantly for this talk, besides his fantastic academic career, he is also quite been involved in many of our startup companies. He is a scientific founder of Caliper Technologies, uh, which has been renamed Caliper Life Sciences and uh, was a car, is in, you know, listed in NASDAQ and was acquired by Perkin Elmer in 2011. He is also a scientific founder of a venture back company's 908 Devices and a new company uh, developing revolutionary compact mass spectrometry and chemical separations based products uh, called Genturi Inc. And, and as well uh, as another company, a genomics tools provider. Uh, uh, which is his Ford startup, Coreta Bio. Uh, and um, he has, like I said, very distinguished scientific career with over 300 papers, but many of you in the audience I know are in a position like him who are coming up with great innovations at the university and are now deciding, now what? What are the next steps? So this will be a fantastic uh, opportunity to ask him questions at the end. How did he manage that from, from working at the university? What did he offer the people he worked with, his students, advisors, CEOs, and so on? Representing uh, the entrepreneurs, we also have a serial entrepreneur, Anil Goyal, who is chairman and CEO of Invention Therapeutics. Uh, and uh, Dr. Goyal has over 24 years uh, in leadership of different public and private biotech companies that include uh, just small names like Ribometrics, uh, Hit Biologics, Renix, uh, which was sold to Pfizer, Authorion, uh, that uh, led to the sale of Sequinum uh, and Baxter, Polyver, Athletics, and Millennium Pharmaceuticals. And he has raised over 200 million from public and private investors, as well as federal sources, and has completed over a billion in pharma deals, uh, you know, and several exits. And as I mentioned, he's a board member of Invention Therapeutics, as well as another startup company from GNC called Encerna Biosciences and his advisor to Minivax. So again, a uh, great opportunity to ask, how can we motivate somebody 
I like an experienced entrepreneur like Neil to work with a startup company, what attracts him, what is fair to get him to, to work with you as a startup company, somebody like himself. Also a fantastic uh, 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 speaker today, uh, the panelist, Dan Fox, uh, who works with Hutch Law. Uh, Hutchinson PLLC is you know, a company that many of our startup companies uh, work with in terms of incorporation. So they offer invaluable advice to many of our scientific founders and entrepreneurs as to how to incorporate. Again, the practice focuses in mergers and acquisitions, venture capital investments and corporate finance, as well as general corporate uh, representation. Um, prior to joining Hutch Law, Dan practiced in Chicago office, uh, uh, McDermott, Will, and Emery. And uh, during his tenure at McDermott, he represented private equity funds and their portfolio companies and public and private companies. Again, he's very experienced in a variety of corporate matters, including mergers and acquisitions, dispositions, joint ventures, financing, restructurings, recapitalization, and securities compliance. So again, a, a lot of, of experience uh, in, in many aspects that will be important for, for you as a startup company joining this call. And last but not least is Matt Cohen, who is a partner at Osage University Partners. He joined uh, Osage in 2013, and he focuses on in investments in therapeutics, diagnostics, medical devices, and, and research tools. And he's been involved in uh, OUP's investment uh, in different portfolio companies, such as Cura Oncology, Spiro Therapeutics, Cell Design Labs, uh, the, uh, that was acquired by Gilead, Biohaven Pharma, uh, it's also listed uh, uh, Iraqi Therapeutics, PMB Pharma, and others. Prior to joining OUP, he was a strategy consultant at LEC and had different biopharma and diagnostic research tool clients in the healthcare and private equity industries. He holds a PhD in cell microbiology from University of Pennsylvania and a BS in microbiology from Pennsylvania State University. And with that, I will let Matt uh, start with the presentation and then we'll go back to the panel with, with questions. Great, thanks so much and uh, appreciate uh, everyone attending and, and taking the time to listen to me. Apologies for any noise in the background. We're all uh, doing the best we can working from home. Uh, let me share my screen and get, bring up the presentation here. And uh, can everyone see that? Great. Okay. All right. So uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I won't. I won't belabor it. Um, so so the, really, this talk is is going to be short. It's going to be about 15 minutes. And uh, all the slides here have been presented before. We actually have a much longer presentation on this topic. There's a YouTube video. Uh, if you go on our website, you, you'll navigate there, and you'll be able to find it. And you can watch an hour talk on this topic with, with additional slides and additional content. We've extracted some of that today, and I'm going to present some of that to you. And it's really focusing on, again, um, some work we've done looking at uh, startups and equity that uh, founders should expect and how to think about dilution over time as you go and raise money uh, for those companies. Um, just the caveat, you know, this data is both for uh, tech companies like software or materials, as well as life science companies like biotech. And, you know, we may get into this a little bit later, but it's not always exactly the same for both of those. So just keep that in mind that we've aggregated some of that data, but there are nuances to how to think about things depending on the sector that, that your technology is actually in. So, so one of the things we did before we started creating this talk was survey our portfolio companies to understand what do uh, founders uh, get uh, in terms of equity. And uh, so we surveyed 20 of our companies, and, and you can see the data there on the right, where founding CEOs typically own anywhere from, uh, you know, 20 to, to 50, 60 percent. And then depending on how many different principal and guest investigator founders there are, they own varying degrees. And we'll get into a little bit about uh, you know, where those variances come from and what they mean. And you can see all the way you know, on the far right there, there's um, a category called passive PI. We'll talk more about that later. And that, that tends to be the lowest chunk of equity. Um, the key thing, though, and the key message you know, I want to get across really for the whole talk is what's on the left. Stick to the mantra, reward for past success, success but incentivize for future performance. And so what that means is, uh, I'm sure a number of people contributed to the intellectual property 
and the technology that's going to go into that startup. And you want to reward those folks for, um, you know, uh, uh, all that hard work and dedication to really producing what they produce. But equity isn't just for what you've done. It's also to incentivize what you're going to do. The more equity someone has in a business, the more they're incentivized to try to make that business grow and make it worth more so that their equity is worth more. And just the reality of the situation is no, no matter what, what industry, the salaries for a very early stage startup, particularly ones that haven't really raised much capital, are, are just going to be a lot lower than what a big company can pay. You know, if you look at what Google pays their software engineers, it's going to be far, far greater than what a, a brand new you know, software startup can pay their engineers. So um, you have to incentivize people somehow to come work and they get incentivized by having equity and ownership in a business that when it grows and is much larger, you know, will be worth potentially more than if they had taken salary, for example, for, for those years. Um, another note here is that, you know, graduate students do need support, is particularly given that there's often asymmetric relationships with, you know, professors they may be co-founding businesses with. So when you think about rewarding for past success, it's very likely that the graduate student professor had uh, uh, both contributed uh, to producing that technology. But then when it comes to, you know, starting the company and who's going to be spending most of their time, uh, or maybe all their time in the case of someone who's, you know, jumping into to actually run the business, um, how do you incentivize them? And what sort of ownership do they need to have to really be incentivized to want to work, you know, really, really hard uh, to grow that business? But again, every situation is different. And so one needs to think about the nuances. So, so moving to like just an initial cap table split. So, you know, a cap table is just simply the, the uh, ownership uh, of the company at any given time. Uh, um, so at, 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 when you first start the company, someone's got to own the business. Someone has to have ownership, right? And so um, this is sort of how we see it. So, you know, about 40% of the company will go to an, maybe the initial CEO or the lead founders, and they'll get a pretty big chunk of the ownership. These people are typically full-time with the company and, and um, uh, really, you know, um, need to be incentivized to work full-time for the company. Then there are several, you know, co-founders and key employees, and those might be scientists, you know, executives who are who are joining, um, you know, um, and that, that might be another 40% of the company, right? And then, and then finally, you know, there's what's called an option pool, and that's to incentivize new hires, you know, that you can award them with with equity as well. They may not be founders, but again, you can't pay them maybe what a big company can pay, so you have to be able to issue them equity in the business to incentivize them to join. Um, you know, we have here as a placeholder 20%, it could be 10%, could be 15, it could be up to 25. Um, and maybe later we'll get, we'll get more into, you know, how do you decide how big of an option pool do you really need? But to drill down into it a little bit in, in more detail, depending on position, um, you know, I, I want to just really just cover the two pieces in bold, active founding scientists and passive founding scientists. And you can see there's a huge difference between these two, two categories. You know, the active founding scientists will get, you know, perhaps 20 to 25 percent of the company when you uh, first form the company. Again, all this is before you raise any money, all pre-financing. And those people could be CEOs, they could be CTOs, but the reality is um, they're spending, you know, at least 30 percent of their time in the startup, if not more. Um, and, and, you know, uh, to, to be honest, you know, if you're a principal investigator at the university, you know, it's going to, you know, you may not be interested in spending, you know, 30, 40, 50 or more percent of your time with the startup. That just might not be, um, you know, what you want to do. So, um, you know, when you begin to think about, well, okay, how much equity should I own? Again, you go back to the mantra, right? You know, I need some equity because of what I've done before, but maybe I don't deserve quite as much or I don't get quite as much because I'm not going to be spending as much time going forward. Um, and I need to make sure I have enough equity, enough room to hire the people, to incentivize the people to come work, work for the company and grow uh, the business so that what I do own will ultimately be worth something one day and, and perhaps worth a lot. Um, again, you know, and I think the other point is, you know, active founding scientists are typically more, you know, typical in tech companies. You know, often we'll see, uh, you know, tech companies that spin out of universities have the PI, um, maybe take a sabbatical for a couple years. That's rather uncommon, for example, for a biotech startup developing new drugs. Um, oftentimes, you know, those folks will um, certainly participate in the early days, be part of scientific advisory boards, but, but quickly hire a team to, to really get things going. Um, and then there's, you know, passive founding scientists. And as you can see, this is a much smaller uh, range of, of typical equity they might be granted up front. 
Um, they might have no title. They might be an advisor or, like I said, on the scientific advisory board, but they, they could be called the chief scientist. But, but, but the fact is they're, they're not spending really that much time at the startup. Um, and, and, you know, maybe a couple hours a week, maybe a couple hours a month. And so, again, you're, you're trying to reward them, you know, give them equity for the past performance, but it's certainly not as much as the equity they might need to be incentivized for future performance. So what are the, what are the consequences of, of allocating, you know, this equity poorly? You know, well, there's several. Um, you know, once you grant equity, you really can't take it back. So, um, you know, if you give somebody a big chunk of the company, but they're not really working at the company, you know, what's, what's their incentive to, to, to um, you know, offer value to a startup? And they really can just sit along for the ride on the cap table without really having to do much. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't want to, you know, kind of read through these, but, you know, the, the really, the, the, if any of these things happen, right, and, and, and you have a poor equity allocation, you, can, you need to get it sorted out. You end up talking to someone like you know Dan um, from Hutch to recapitalize your company, and that involves you know perhaps removing shareholders, restructuring the cap table, and it gets messy and it gets complicated. And sometimes the best thing you can do is just you know uh, terminate the business and just start again, you know build a new one from scratch, which again is costs money and time. Um, so you know how do investors think about those kinds of situations? And and, and the reality is we think about them um, the same way I just described it. They take time and they're challenging. And sometimes, you know, the headache's just not worth it. So, um, you know, there are certainly investors who will just pass on a deal, you know, rather than deal with having to clean up with, a, you know, a cap table, that's sort of a mess. So, you know, I, I should just add, you know, that's sort of a plug for, for Dan and, and, and attorneys like him who um, really can help you in the early days of thinking through how to structure a cap table and, and do it correctly. And I should add, you know, the same consequences can apply if you take money from a bad investor. You know, someone who um, gets a lot of equity for a very small investment, um, you know, will, perhaps will have control and not let you take money from investors who could really help you or take money down the line because, you know, they don't want to be diluted or they want, you know, all that equity to themselves. So, you know, you can create poor culture, you, you can get obstruction. And again, at the bottom there, there's some terms and things you can look out for, which, which we just don't have time to go into specifically today. Um, you know, next I wanted to just take everyone through, you know, what a typical ownership might look like through rounds. So, um, you know, it, the, the lightest, you know, that, that light blue there all the way at the bottom is the lead founder CEO equity. And you, and you see there, you know, at, at the seed round, you know, they're going to be some dilution and they, you might raise some money. And, and you know, if, as you go through this in the series A and you raise a series B and a series C, maybe this is sort of like a typical, you know, company. Um, I could say, you know, you probably raise a lot more if you're biotech maybe a little bit less if you're a software or something and you don't need as much capital. But in the end, you know, there's going to be dilution. You're not going to own as much as you did when you first started. But, you know, you're, there's a reason why you're willing to do that. You're willing to do that because you need the capital. You might need the expertise you know, that investors can bring and, and the networks. And, and there's, a, uh, there's a saying that one of my, one of my partners uh, likes to say, which is, um, you know, a small piece of a big pie is much better than a big piece of a small pie. So if you own 100% of something that's worth zero, um, that's worth zero. Um, if you own, you know, 50% of something that's worth a million dollars, well, it's worth $500,000. That's great. But if you own 10% of something worth a billion dollars, well, that's $100 million. And $100 million is a lot better than, you know, half a million dollars. So, you know, the, the really the key there and the way to think about it is when you do take investment and you do take dilution, that you use those dollars to grow the value of the business to be, you know, larger than the investment uh, dilution that you took. And so that's sort of the way to think about why dilution is actually a good thing and not a bad thing. Because even though you own less, what you own is of a much bigger pie and therefore more valuable. Um, I think it's really important to, to note that scientific founders um, um, you know, create a lot of value for a company. And so, um, you know, like I said earlier in tech, some professors will spend one to two years of, of leave just founding the company and getting things off the ground. And they, then they'll often go back to the university. Um, you know, in life sciences, that's, that's atypical. Professors usually stay with the university and, and participate in other ways. Um, um, but, you know, over time, you know, as a startup begins to grow, you know, the, the value of the scientific founder may not be in the in the day to day operations. It may be in other areas, which we sort of describe there at the bottom. And so there are very good reasons to continue to issue stock options to scientific founders to be on the scientific advisory board or continue to be advisors to the company. And that's, you know, you do want continued thought leadership on the science. 
Um, there's going to be new research that in your lab that might be next generation versions of what the company is working on. And so that can create a pipeline of innovation for these companies, which they really value. Um, there's other, uh, other sorts of benefits like students coming out of the lab um, that may have technical skills that the company values. Um, you, you as a PI may have research connections with major companies. Um, you know, you, you, you really get that cutting edge view. And then you, uh, as a, as a you know, professor, often probably have colleagues at other universities who have um, other views and, and, and cutting edge views, perhaps, that can contribute to, to the startup from an advisory perspective as well. So we think there's lots of good options uh, or lots of good reasons for, for giving options to Sign Day founders to continue to you know, incentivize folks who are you know, maybe, again, only a couple hours a week, even a couple hours a year, uh, actually spending time with the company. But, but can still add a lot of value in unique ways while you continue to, to do your, you know, your day job of, of academic research. So, you know, just again, some key takeaways here around equity ownership and, and how to think about, um, you know, keeping a piece of, of what ultimately can be a really big pie in success. Um, and that's that, you know, dilution from equity is necessary and it's, it, it's a compromise, but it's what, it's what you need to get to a large exit. Ultimately, you can't do it by yourself. You need to hire people. And you need to hire great people, and great people are incentivized by uh, equity. Um, there's there's several key terms again that we didn't get into that control a payout that we're happy to get into later, or or, or perhaps you know you know I'll or someone from my fund will have an opportunity to, to give the the whole talk uh, uh, at UNC um, you know maybe one day in the future. Um, I think you should note that you know investors will get paid out first. That's very typical. So if you do take investment. Um, investors typically get their money back first, so just kind of keep that in mind. And then finally, you know, investors, they're doing the math uh, uh, every time they invest around getting, you know, getting paid out and how much, how much money they make in, in various uh, uh, versions of success. And as a startup, uh, you should absolutely do the same exact cap table math and understand that, like I showed you in that, in that stacked bar chart, um, you know, if we, if we raise a series A of this size, then a series B, and then a series C, you know, how much is everyone going to own? And then what if we sell a company for a million dollars or $50 million or a billion dollars? You know, what do those payouts actually look like based on the terms of the investment that we took? And so since investors are doing this, again, so should everyone else. And so I just want to end there, um, you know, make sure we have lots of time for questions and, and for the other panelists to be able to contribute, you know, their unique experiences and insights. Um, but again, um, you know, OUP, you know, we're, we're a venture capital fund. We invest in startups that spin out from universities and research institutions, uh, partnered with over 100 of these institutions, including uh, UNC um, and, and, other, and, and certainly other universities in the RTP area. So really appreciate uh, everyone uh, listening and taking the time uh, out of the day to, to, to spend with us and look forward to answering some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And I just want to say that we are going to be sharing this the slides with everybody who's participating uh, as well um, in, in in this call on this webinar. Um, and I wanted to start with a question to to Mike Mike Ramsey. Uh, as I said, he he's a serial academic uh, uh, founder, entrepreneur, has lots of experience working with with many startup companies. So, Mike, would you say do you know? Can you tell us a little more about you know how you structured those first employees in, in your different companies and their compensation? Did it kind of follow the same type of pattern that uh, that Matt was uh, describing here? And how did it differ for like the different types of employees, whether those were students, uh, the CEO, uh, other other partners as well? Yeah. So let's see. I make sure I'm off mute. You can hear me. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, a broad range of experiences, uh, you know, so far all the companies I've started have been you know, VC backed, right? So we've really started the company with uh, money on day one. And um, so it's usually was a uh, collaboration with the investors in terms of compensation of those early people. Um, See, I've uh, actually never had a student move uh, from my lab into uh, uh, directly into the company. Um, I, well, I guess there were a couple in the case of 908 devices, uh, but you know, I tend to run my group with staff scientists and postdocs and as well as students. And uh, so it's been more uh, the more senior people staff who were working on the technology that uh, uh, was involved in the company that, that moved into the company. So. 
And would, were those ranges kind of, uh, obviously considering the investment, you kind of started uh, kind of later than, than those, would, would those reflect accurately? Would you say uh, what was presented here? You know, was that your experience? Did it vary a lot between companies with, with the four companies you started? Uh, well, I would say there was uh, quite a bit of consistency between the companies. They're all in the life sciences tools space, basically. Uh, you know, one question to Matt is, you know, the numbers he's showing, you know, is it uh, uh, pre-money or post-money? I mean, I usually think of, uh, you know, ownership of equity uh, post-Series A, right, because wrapped around that is the pre-money valuation of the company, which is a really important parameter. And maybe Matt can respond to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so everything we showed today was pre-Series A. So it's what people would own before taking any in, in investment. And you know, Mike, you know your you know your reputation and ability to you know start these wonderful companies um, with you know with venture backing is um, awesome and and um, something that you know a lot of startups don't get don't get that you know you know, great, great head start. So what we tried to do is show people, you know, if you're just starting today and you're not really getting any investment, you know, what, how, how should people split the pie from day one? You know, how, how, how should, how, you know, should everyone get an equal amount, right? Didn't everyone contribute equally before? So shouldn't get everyone get equal or, you know, should we be more thoughtful about it? And so that's really the message we're trying to convey, but you're totally right. Once you raise a series A, everyone's going to be diluted. And, um, you kind of want to think about, again, it's really the same mantra, even after you raise a series A, do the key people own enough to be incentivized to work really hard to grow the value over time? And yeah, kinda, I, yeah, go ahead. And I was going to say also to bring in uh, the entrepreneur side of things, and Neil, um, maybe you could also kind of speak from, from somebody who's interested working with, with a company uh, and is working with an uh, academic founder, how, uh, you know, what motivates you to, to go in terms of equity and structure and deals, particularly with these early stage companies that may not have quite investment yet? Yeah. So I, I want to say, actually, Matt has just set the stage for some of this discussion and Mike uh, just talking about many, many companies that he started. I would say from an entrepreneur side, from me wanting to come and help uh, uh, founders, for me, actually, it's less about the equity in the beginning. I just want to get to know the founder get to know the science? Am I able to contribute to that science? Can I really progress that company? So I first foremost for me is just getting to know. So almost every relationship that I've had, I have had some time to get to know the founders and the science. I would do a consulting relationship in the beginning just to re really get to know at risk too, right? So I've taken many, many risks as you know with companies. So I do not actually start with, am I going to own 50% of the company? That is not the place I start. So I started with just getting to know the scientists, scientific credibility. Uh, you know, can I really make something out of this in my life? Uh, or am I just gonna have to throw this away in one or two years? Um, so that's to me becomes the paramount reason. I know there are lots of entrepreneurs out there. For me, it's, it's that. The second is, is it a disease I care about? See, I'm in the, in the, in the therapeutics business uh, and I wanna care about, am I really solving patient problem out there? I just don't wanna create a widget or a tool it has to be driven by, by some value to the patient. So those are the two real important things for me initially. After that, it all comes about exactly the things that Matt said, you know, how much do I own? Did I, can I contribute to this in the future? Uh, and if I contribute to that in the future, the board and the founders would reward me for that. Uh, so that's how I look at part in my role. And what do you value more, your time or your equity? Uh, you know, initially it's my time. Uh, it's, it's, it's all, I mean, where am I spending my time? Is it going to be of value or not? So equity is not important to me in the beginning, uh, but equity becomes more because now I'm contributing more and more time to the, to the organization. So uh, at least that's how I've done it uh, you know, in my own life. Particular. But I know a lot of people who do it differently. Quite so, so Anil, to kind of follow up on that train of thought, then how how does our, has your perspective changed as the company matures? What do you expect in terms of equity in time as as the company starts getting their first rounds of investments and later? Yeah. So I first of all start with uh, you know, and most of my friends who are probably on the phone here also know, I start with uh, with the view that I am temporary. I mean, nobody is permanent in this business. 
So I can come and go. So I, I start with the goal, I'm gonna do a few years as the company grows. Uh, after the company becomes in the clinical stage, really there's somebody else that's in, uh, important to manage that company and go forward. And they will get more equity, probably more than I did. Uh, so I don't look at my relationship with the company that way. I hope I'm answering your question uh, uh, sufficiently. Uh, or Did I understand it properly? Yeah, I guess I was going with like, I imagine you would expect as the company does get investment that you would get either a higher equity stake in the future uh, that it's just been or a vesting terms and then or uh, some sort of salary compensation once yeah, there yeah. is investment into the company. Uh, so so I took so great uh, clarification to that question. So yes, initially my relationships, when I really become involved as a CEO, it's primarily based on equity. There's no, no, generally no cash involved. Uh, it's, it's, you know, and then it becomes a cash plus equity uh, conversation. So once we raise some investor money, then I think it's appropriate for me to feed the family uh, with, with, uh, with, with some real food rather than paper. Then you work with a lot of startup companies. You know, what would you say, you know, we just kind of briefly touched upon things like vesting, you know, what do you typically recommend your clients in terms of that and in terms of uh, also structure? Again, does it follow also in the lines of what man was talking about in the presentation? So uh, I'm gonna say I actually have to come and clean up things most of the time <laughs> with the help of Dan and Hutch to really change the conversation of what is the equity split that the company should have. Uh, so quite a few of my uh, you know relationships with founders have been just that have already started a company is to really rethink the uh, composition. So I'd, as Matt mentioned, the huge uh, incentive for new employees is that shares. And if founders don't understand the idea of options, option pool, uh, then we have a big challenge uh, being able to hire, hire people. So I would say it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge company of renegotiating the thinking they already had. So some founders, you know, as, as I've experienced in many, many have experienced will basically give out equity for no reason. Uh, they've never talked to a lawyer probably, uh, uh, but they've given out equity. And so then you have to come back and clean up that, uh, that cap structure as Matt uh, mentioned. Uh, and that becomes pretty messy uh, if you have to do it uh, you know, at a stage when you're looking to uh, raise the funding from an investor. So I try to do that in the beginning part of the, when I come to know about the equity structure of the company, how bad it is. You've been cut off, I think. Sure. And then from Hutch Love, what, what do you say again would be kind of your experience working with, with clients in this space in terms, yeah. Yeah. I, again. yeah, I would agree with what the other panelists have said. I think, you know, I don't want to get lost on one of the early slides that Matt showed, but you know, every situation is different. Um, every situation is unique. Um, and, and what we always advocate for our clients um, it's a slight, slight tweak to what Matt showed in the slide when he said that you can't take equity away. Um, we actually do encourage all founders to get restricted stock as their equity and to allocate that restricted stock between what, what we call as vested, which cannot be taken away, which is consistent with Matt's presentation, but the, the equity they're getting for future contributions or future performance should absolutely be subject to the achievement of that future performance, or at least um, staying with the company for a duration of time sufficient to, you know, prove or disprove and, and make contributions towards the achievement of that. So that time horizon that we usually see is, is four years. Um, I think it's generally market. Some investors will push you to five. Um, but in the lines and in the vein of every situation is unique, if you're a true startup and you're forming the company to sort of get STTRs or other grants, and you're going to be working under those grants for two or three years, you should fully expect as a founder that when investors come in, they're going to add on more vesting time to the, to those units or to that stock because they're investing as much in the team as they are in the underlying technology, especially in the early stages. And so, they want to make sure that team is incentivized and they're still around the table for, for a sufficient period of time. So, you know, all of this changes, all of it can be, you know, redone. We try not to redo it, but as you've heard from Anil and from Matt, 
it, it can be done. It can be a, a, a bad situation to do that. But when we talk about who you should be putting on the cap table, it is absolutely people like Anil who are thinking about, can I contribute to this? Let me think about the equity secondarily. Like, it, can I help advance this company? Because at Hutch, we, we tend not to represent people who own cupcakes. We'd rather them own like Costco sized cakes where they own a little slice of that giant cake. Um, Cause you might feel good owning hundred percent of your cupcake, but you know, it's only going to be worth so much. If you can get that pie or you can get that cake larger and larger, that's where the real returns are, both for you, your investors, your employees. Owning 100% is not, is not the way to do it. Great. Um, and I want to we have a question um, from somebody in, in the audience that is for, for Mike and uh, and the question is, you know, if you uh, can make a choice now, do you still want to run a company by yourself or do you sell, serve as a technical advisor? And, and to add to that question, I would also ask, you know, because we've been talking about investment and dilution, you know, how, you know, how was your role in, in these companies? You were, you know, again, um, in a very nice situation, you were, uh, all of these companies, you were able to have investment from the beginning. Were you quite involved, you know, uh, as, as a founder or were you just a, a technical advisor from the very beginning as well? Eh? Yeah, so see a range of experiences, I guess, uh, for the question from the audience. Um, you know, I, I guess I always have chose to be an advisor and, and on the board of directors of companies because I want the freedom to work on the next idea, right, for the next company. Um, and being in the company as an employee of the company, yeah, you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have that freedom. So I guess I try to have a foot on both sides of the fence, um, if you will. Um, and let's see, what, what was, can you briefly state your question again, uh, Myra? Yeah, and then, so again, because you did have um, uh, investment from the beginning, yeah, did your role in the company change uh, yeah, uh, as the company also got later rounds as well? Did you become less involved uh, with the company? Yes, uh, yeah, sort of my view of uh, involvement in a startup company in my experience has been sort of an exponential uh, you know, decrease in terms of time involvement uh, you know, with a, uh, a uh, um, relaxation time of maybe a year and a half, 18 months, something like that. So. Uh, in my experience, I've been very heavily involved uh, in the early days. Uh, you know, I've flown to the West Coast for a two-hour meeting and back, right? And uh, yeah. so fly out early in the morning and catch the red eye back. And so that sort of activity. But later on, right, it, it's, uh, yeah, much less time intensive. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And then a question for, for Matt or Dan. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, I don't know if you have any case studies or any examples you might want to share with us about, um, you know, whether it's like uh, clients or invest, uh, people you've invested in that, you know, have done something, you know, that you wish have done differently with their, with their cap table, you know, uh, and uh, you know, uh, something that you can really advise the audience here not, not to do, uh, 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 or, you know, best, you know, the flip side, you know, uh, good practices that you like to see when working with with companies as well. Huh? Uh, I, I'll start. I think one of the things uh, that we see a lot, and, and Matt touched on it a bit, is um, often scientific founders just give away equity because they want to be nice people or someone made kind of a minor contribution. Um, and And that's all well and good, but I think the investors are going to come in and they're going to look at they're going to take their pot and, and their share of the company, whatever that may be, whatever you negotiate it, and everything else is divided amongst everybody else. And so if you've given kind of significant chunks of equity or even equity that has the same voting rights as you do or equity that can block certain votes, that can be very problematic for the company. And so to the extent you want to be magnanimous and you want to kind of recognize early contributions for people that are no longer involved, talk with counsel, 
set up voting and non-voting stock, make sure that the people who are involved in the company are the ones that can make the decisions going forward that are best for the company. Because there's nothing worse than having a great investor lined up to invest and you're chasing down some, you know, third year graduate student from 12 years ago who holds 3% of the company and your formation documents say you need unanimity to, to make a change. Like, you think about what you're doing with your equity, think about where their votes are going and, and always be aware of where the people on your cap table are and how to get in touch with them because inevitably there will be something that they need to approve or sign off on or get notice of. Yeah, well said, Dan. Thank you. And, you know, I won't, I won't belabor these, these points, but I mean, I think what I said earlier is probably the, the thing we see the most, which is, you know, there are three founders. So rather than have the hard conversation about how much should each founder own um, relative to, again, rewarding for past performance and then incentivizing for future performance, it's, 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 it's a less con uh, confrontational discussion to say, we'll each get a third. And, and each getting a third is almost never the right answer for the way the structure should actually be set up because it's almost never the case that everyone's gonna be contributing time, effort equally going forward. Um, so, you know, I think that's the one, again, the message that I wanna deliver the most here today about when you first set up that, uh, that, that, that structure, in addition to everything Dan said is, you know, um, you have to have the hard conversations first. And if it's easier to have them with counsel, uh, present, you should, you know, you got to get counsel involved um, because there's so many repercussions down the line that you don't always think about, uh, as Dan described. Um, but again, um, you know, is it possible that everyone should get a third? Yes, but it's usually not the reality of, of the situation. Uh, and just another add on to that, and, you know, while I will always advocate that everyone should have counsel. You know, while we bring experience and expertise as to how to structure these things, we often act as a really good foil where you can put us up as the one who's broaching these hard topics and conversations. And it's not even necessarily, you don't need to ascribe intent, intent to any of these bad actions. You know, over the course of the life cycle of a company, Founders will die, founders will get divorced, founders will move away or have children or get pulled in a hundred different directions. And it's really about protecting the company and protecting what you've all built and, and figuring out how those situations should be addressed. And just like I would advise everybody to have a will, think about the company as you know its own separate entity, which it is that you need to provide for these unknown circumstances and nobody's a bad person if somebody got a better job and moved to California and isn't involved in the day-to-day -day anymore it's just life so so maybe I can add a little bit from uh, from my perspective actually the role of a scientific founder changes dramatically over the course of the life of the company and it changes in my view from the initial as you know deep scientific engagement Essentially, there is a company that's running that, that scientific endeavor. So two questions to, to ask Matt, Mike, is you know, how much have you seen that scientific role change uh, or the contribution to the company change? And then how does that role at the board level change? Because sometimes scientific founders are at the corporate board level uh, or involved in the corporate board, but they have to come off at some point. Uh, so what's your view? because you've seen it in both, both sides from an investor and a, and a founder. So maybe Matt, you could go yeah. first, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, no, from, from the investor perspective, and, and what I primarily invest in is, is like your space, Emil, right? Biotech and drug discovery. And as I said in the, during the, the slide presentation, it's very rare to see a faculty member take a leave of absence from their lab and go work for the company even 50% or even 25% of their time. Um, it, it's happened, it's possible, it's just uncommon. Um, so, so the role you know, from day one often is, um, could be director, as, you know, as Mike is on a lot of his companies, uh, so actually on the board, 
it might not be on the as a, as a board director it might just be you know on the scientific advisory board and usually the chairman of that scientific advisory board is instrumental in creating and building out that scientific advisory board with other people they know uh, who have you know relevant uh, uh, technical expertise or experience um, that complements their own um, you know and 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 you know so the way I describe that especially for biotech is you know, you're you're trying to find le leadership, like a Neil, like a CEO, who you really trust and you want to get into a marriage with. And in fact, it may last longer than some marriages last. So you really got to be, you know, with someone you really like and really could get along with and complement your own skill set because you're going to turn you're going to turn the keys over to them. They're going to be running the business day to day. In other sectors, you know, you know, my colleagues at OUP invest in like software and and other and and, and some of those areas. Sometimes the the PIs will take leave of absence, take time. They, they might be the initial CEO of the company and they'll be the CEO for a period of time. And often that's to get the technology to a point of actually it looking like a product or an initial product. And then frequently there's then a new CEO who's brought in who has a different skill set, someone who understands the product market fit concepts and can continue to shape that initial product into something that the market really wants and can use and you can sell. And that's often a slightly different skill set than maybe the, the founding scientist has as CEO. So you begin to transition that person uh, to CTO, chief technical officer, if they want to continue to remain with the company in a, in a more you know, stepped up role. Or sometimes they'll take a step back and that person will then, again, go back to the university and then move into, again, a scientific advisory kind of role. So it can vary quite a bit. Um, it's really up to the founder and in, in what they want. Um, but it, it's almost never, there's almost, it's, it's never the case that, you know, one person has all the skills to build these kinds of companies based on deep technical science from universities into something really big. It, you know, it takes a village and, and, you know, and to build that village, you need to, you know, share your equity, essentially. And uh, Judy has been, uh, you know, collecting questions from the audience and uh, I'll let her ask the questions in a minute. I just want to, following up uh, on this, I want to ask a question to all the panelists and uh, whoever wants to respond is like, that, that is to be understood that the role of the faculty founder will decrease over time and uh, that they might be better suited as a chief technical officer or on the scientific board. Uh, however, you know, um, as you can imagine, many of this um, faculty founders have been heavily involved for decades or years in developing their technologies and uh, they create their baby, their company, uh, and as they get diluted out, you know, what is reasonable to expect here? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and Mike, maybe you can sp speak from experience. Uh, have they retained, and what do you recommend for them to retain enough equity at the end of, of the company's life cycle? You know, when they gets an exit or uh, you know, gets acquired or, or so on, you know? What are your yeah. respective <laughs> founders? How they lose the, some of the equity moving forward? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure Matt has a broader perspective than, than I do. I was having seen more companies. Uh, in my first company, Caliper Technologies, right, I uh, had no experience, uh, went in green. I, I didn't really have people advising me. And um, yeah, I would uh, say I, yeah, I didn't come out with uh, the amount of equity that I probably should have at the, the point of our IPO. Uh, nonetheless, it was uh, you know, very much a learning experience. Unfortunately, it was sort of on the job training. Um, but, uh, you know, the outcome was still positive, right? I mean, as a, I, I think it's a different perspective as a, an inventor, uh, you know, versus someone who's looking at it as, as a business opportunity that uh, for me, just having inventions, uh, technology that we were involved in developing, get out to society and be used, right? That's very emotionally rewarding. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, Caliper was a good experience. I think um, equity-wise, financially-wise, I, I probably should have done, uh, um, you know, a factor of five or so better than I actually did. But, uh, um, you know, that experience uh, certainly uh, improved my situation going in and negotiating for, for the following follow-on companies. I think, I think it's a yeah, well-known fact that um, the second time a scientific founder starts a company, they often are asked for and are able to get more equity than they may have gotten the first time. Um, it's 
a product of making money for your investors and them having confidence you'll make money for them again. Yeah, yeah, having a successful turn uh, helps a lot, I think. <laughs> so if I if I could add to that is I, I do I have seen uh, founders uh, be so focused on controlling the company that they actually lose track of what needs to be uh, invested in building that story and deals have fallen apart and companies have actually gone away because of that uh, focus on, um, on, on, that, uh, on that piece of control, not in terms of equity, but just control. So if you, if you don't know, there's a book by Noam Washerman from Harvard Business School called Founder's Dilemma. And that actually very clearly says you can either be a king of your castle, which is empty, or you could be a rich person with, with no castle. So you have to choose where you want to be as a scientific founder in that long spectrum. And it's, he's got a great book, uh, uh, an article out there that I would recommend scientific founders to read uh, uh, you know, first. Yeah, and just to piggyback on, on what Mike said, you know, the, the first company, you might not have come out as well on the equity, but you, you learned so much. And so not only did you learn to negotiate for more equity, but you learned all the other aspects of, you know, helping build this into a commercially relevant, successful enterprise. And so I think not to put my investor council hat on too much, but, you know, you, you were more deserving of, in that second time of having a greater equity stake than perhaps in the first. And, and I think, if, if you're, if you're hyper focused on kind of what the magic percentage is or, or how, how much of this you own, you're, you're missing in many ways, the bigger picture of how much is the entity worth? So yeah, if you have a, a, a low to middling exit, it's more important that you have a bigger percentage. But if you have, as Matt said, a billion dollar company, you can have a really small percentage of a billion dollar company and come out very, very well. And so really the focus should be is every step, are you suffering that dilution, as Matt said, in furtherance of building the company and making it bigger and better and worth more? Because then you're probably coming out ahead, even though your percentage is being reduced. And I think if you go in hyper-focused on this was my idea, I need to keep at least 10%, you're going to inherently inhibit kind of the growth of the company to where it could ultimately get to. Another way to say, Dan, what you're saying also is that it, it, this, is how, this is why in team is so important. Because once you take investment, that money is dilutive, it's diluting your equity. But the point of that money is to grow the business. And so if the money's not spent well by a really strong team, that can execute and grow that business, you suffer dilution for very little gain, really no gain, and actually at a loss. So um, that's why it's so important to have a, a really strong team. And that's why it's worth making sure that team is incentivized um, because you, re you really wanna maximize all probabilities that the money you take uh, is used in the best possible way. Yeah, I, 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 if I can, I'll just amplify on that, right? It's, uh, it's all about getting a product out there and, and the fastest way and most capital efficient way you can. And yeah, you, you don't want to be greedy about that, right? You, you want to build a team. And I've certainly seen colleagues who uh, took the position that, yeah, this is my idea. This is my company. I want to maintain control and yeah, it's been unsuccessful, right? They can't bring investors in with that sort of attitude. So it's again, the, you have 100% of nothing, right? And uh, that's not a, a winning strategy. Great, um, well, we have two questions from the audience I, I want to make sure that we address. And I think this ties in um, really nicely to this last topic uh, around incentivizing. And the first question is a two part question. How can early stage companies approach incentiv in incentive compensation for key contributors after series A raise? Do investors tend to resist awarding options for deferred executive compensation or sweat equity. 
I wonder if this will be a problem following this pandemic crisis when market performance will be heavily impacted. Would anyone like to take a shot at answering that? Start from an entrepreneur side, uh, from, from a CEO role. I tell you, it is actually not enough to have just equity anymore. Uh, people are getting paid very well in this, in our business of biotech and pharma business. And so really finding very good scientists uh, with drug development experience is very hard. So if you just offer them equity, I think you're going to be losing the battle. So the board and the investors really have to think hard about making sure there's enough capital in the company to hire the right people with the right experience who are willing to, uh, you know, not just risk for equity. So that's my personal view. And in fact, you know, in the hiring one of the companies, I could not offer any equity. I wanted the person and he, she wanted really, so look, I have an offer. Can you offer me something comparable? And we had to make them ends meet. Uh, now it's my job to actually make sure I offer equity going forward because that's the better incentive. Uh, they're incentivized to to grow the company further. So I just, just share with you perspective on equity is no longer just the only currency. You need hard, hard cash as well. Um, Matt, from an investor perspective, did you want to add anything to that regarding the resistance toward options? Um. I, I, it's a hard question. I, I, I have not personally seen resistance towards options myself. Um, I don't think that's going to change. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have much more to add than other, other than what Neil said, but um, um, something to, something to look out for. So I think there's a couple, just to make sure we're addressing the question correctly. Um, if you do a series A round and you plan to kind of compensate people for work that was done prior to the series A round with additional options or equity, I would tell the founders that they should fully expect that those options should be treated as if they were outstanding prior to the investment round so that the investors are not suffering that dilution for prior contributions. Um, and important thing to remember about options is when you grant the option, you should be granting them at or above the fair market value of the company and that share as of that date. And so, you know, if you're looking at rewarding past performance, whether or not the company grows in the future, you should really question whether options are the right mechanic for doing that because they're only going to participate in the upside of the company going forward uh, based on the strike price. So just things to consider there. But I think investors would fully expect that to be included in the pre-money. Great. Yeah. Like anything, it's a, it'll, it'll be a negotiation, but typically you're going to, you know, you're going to agree on, um, if, if, for example, you know, there's going to be a big, um, Series A round, and you're going to have to create a new option pool to re-incentivize people. You know that that you want to you want to get to a number where you say, okay, what that what that has to be included in the pre, and the, and the words to look out for are the words fully diluted. Look for the words fully diluted pre money, and that'll tell you everything's in that. The whole kitchen sinks in that. The option pools, any outstanding convertible notes, everything's in the fully diluted pre money. So you know if you just see the words pre money ask the question, is that the fully diluted free money? What does that mean? Great. Um, on that subject, uh, we have another two-part question here. Uh, and this is actually a, a case study somewhat. Um, assuming a four-year vesting schedule for a new or non-founding CEO who leaves two years in after securing a Series A, if there's no trigger, what happens to their uninvested shares? Are they allocated to the option pool? Um, is the ability of the departing CEO to purchase option on accelerated schedule or must the company repurchase? Uh, so the, there's understanding that there may be some differences based on the exact situation, but um, what is customary in this particular situation? Uh, for, from my perspective, uh, 
if you're bringing a CEO who's one of their main goals and, and incentives is to secure the Series A, then you should have the vesting schedule on their options or their stock reflect that through either a milestone or something else occurring when the Series A has happened. Um, generally, we see four year, for, for employees who are non-founders, we usually see four year vesting with a one year cliff. So the, the, the CEO in this example would have already satisfied the cliff. If they were issued options, the company doesn't need to do anything with the unvested because they just don't become exercisable. They would be returned to the pool, they would be canceled. Um, if the CEO had negotiated and received restricted stock, which they might have done for tax purposes, uh, it can be advantageous to get the stock early and start your holding period. Um, then those documents, if they were drafted by, you know, a venture attorney or, or a startup attorney, should include the right for the company to purchase those back for de minimis consideration or the consideration that was paid, if any was actually paid. Um, our documents, as a general matter, provide for that to happen automatically without any action on the part of the company. Um, all that the CEO would then be entitled to would be that cash payment of usually a dollar or less than a dollar if, if they didn't pay anything for the stock initially. Great, well that's it for the audience Q&A. Great, I wanna thank everybody um, for again, valuable contributions everyone made. I think, you know, again, this is, as I mentioned at the beginning, such a big question we always get asked at Kickstart. What is you know, the right amount of equity I should give out uh, for different parties? And this is very useful. Um, we will share again the, the slides with everybody. Please feel free uh, to, to email us, to email uh, myself or Judy uh, with any questions uh, you might have. We'll try to connect you with all the panelists if uh, you want a particular try to kind of forward any comments or questions you might have to them as well.